Well, what would you have done if you had found him wandering on your native world? Edgeworks Entertainment presents... Short Transmissions. Stories to rocket you into space. Tonight, Youth by Isaac Asimov. Part 3, The Finale. Source, Gutenberg.org. Lunch was halfway over when Slim dashed into the dining room. For a moment, he stood abashed, and then he said in what was almost hysteria, oh, I've got to speak to Red. I, 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 I've got to say something. Red looked up in fright, but the astronomer said, I don't think so, son. You're being very impolite. You've kept lunch waiting. I'm sorry, father. Oh, don't, don't read the lad, said the industrialist wife. He can speak to Red if he wants to, and then there was no damage done to the lunch. I've got to speak to Red, alone, Slim insisted. Now that's enough, said the astronomer with a kind of gentleness that was obviously manufactured for the benefit of strangers and which had beneath it an easily recognized edge. Take your seat. Slim did so, but he ate only when someone looked directly upon him. Even then he was not very successful. Red caught his eyes. He made soundless words. Did the animals get loose? Slim shook his head slightly. He whispered, No, it's... The astronomer looked at him hard, and Slim faltered to a stop. With lunch over, Red slipped out of the room, with a microscopic motion at Slim to follow. They walked in silence to the creek. Then Red turned fiercely upon his companion. Look here. What's the idea of telling my dad we were feeding the animals? Slim said, I, I didn't. I asked what you feed animals. That's not the same thing as saying we were doing it. And besides, it's something else, Red. But Red had not used up his grievances. And where did you go anyway? I thought you were coming to the house. They acted like it was my fault that you weren't there. But I'm trying to tell you about that. If only you'd shut up for a second and let me talk. You don't give a fellow a chance. Well, go on and tell me if you've got so much to say. I'm trying to. I went back to the spaceship. The folks weren't there anymore, and, and I, I wanted to see what it was like. It isn't a spaceship, said Red sullenly. He had nothing to lose. It is, too. I looked inside. You could look through the ports, and they were dead. He looked sick. They were dead. Who were dead? Slim screeched. Animals! Like our animals. Only they aren't animals. They're, they're people things. They're from other planets. For a moment, Red might have been turned to stone. It didn't occur to him to disbelieve Slim at this point. Slim looked too genuinely bare of just tidings. He said finally, Oh, my. Well, what are we going to do? Golly, will we get a whopping if they find out? I mean, I, I was shivering. Mm, we better turn them loose, said Red. They'll tell on us. They can't talk our language, not if they're from another planet. Yes, they can, because I remember my father talking about some stuff like that to my mother when he didn't know I was in the room, and he was talking about visitors who could talk with the mind. Telepathy, telepathy, or something? I, I thought he was making it up. Holy smokes. Red looked up. I tell you, my dad said to get rid of them. Let's sort of bury them somewhere or, or throw them in the creek. He told you to do that. He made me say I had animals, and then he said, get rid of them. I gotta do what he says. I mean, holy, holy smokes, he's my dad. Some of the panic left Slim's heart. It was a thoroughly legalistic way out. Well, uh, let's do it right now, then, before they find out. Oh, golly, what if they find out? We're gonna be in trouble. They broke into a run toward the barn, unspeakable visions in their minds. It was different looking at them as though they were people. As animals, they had been interesting. People, horrible. Their eyes, which were neutral little objects before, now seemed to watch them with active malevolence. They're making noises, said Slim in a whisper, which was barely audible. I guess they're talking or something, said Red. Funny that those noises which they had heard before had not had significance earlier. He was making no move toward them. Neither was Slim. The canvas was off, but they were just watching. The ground meat, Slim noticed, hadn't been touched. Slim said, aren't you going to do something? <laughs> aren't you? Um, you found them. 
Well, it's your turn now. No, it isn't. You found them. It's your fault. The whole thing. I, I was watching. You joined in, Slim, and you know you did. I don't care. You found them, and that's what I'll say when they come back here looking for us. Red said. All right for you. But the thought of the consequences inspired him anyway, and he reached for the cage door. Slim said, wait. Red was glad to. He said, now what's biting you? One of them's got something on him that looks like it might be iron or something. Where? Right there. I, I saw it before, but I thought it was just part of him. But if he's people, maybe it's a disintegrator gun. What's that? I read about it in the books from before the wars. Mostly people with spaceships have disintegrator guns, and they point them at you, and you get disintegrated. They didn't point it at us till now, pointed out Red with his heart not quite in it. I don't care. I'm not hanging around here and getting disintegrated. I I'm getting my father. Cowardly cat. Yellow cowardy cat. I don't care. You can call all the name. You can call me all the names you want. But if you bother me now, you'll get disintegrated. You wait and see. It'll it's gonna be your fault. He made for the narrow spiral stairs that led to the main floor of the barn. Stopped at its head and then backed away. Red's mother was moving up, panting a little with the exertion and smiling a tight smile for the benefit of Slim in his capacity as guest. Red, you, you Red, are, are you up there? Now don't don't you try to hide. I know this is where you're keeping them. Cook saw where you ran with the meat. Red quavered, "Hello, Ma. Now show me those nasty animals. I'm going to see to it that you get rid of them right away." It was over. And despite the imminent corporal punishment, Red felt something like a load fall from him. At least the decision was out of his hands. Right there, Ma. I didn't do anything to him, Ma. I, I, I didn't know. They just looked like little animals, and I, I thought you'd let me keep them, Ma. I, I, I wouldn't have taken the meat, only they wouldn't eat grass or leaves, and we couldn't find good nuts or berries, and the cook never lets me have anything, or I, I would have asked her, and I didn't know it was for lunch, and... He was speaking on the sheer momentum of terror and did not realize that his mother did not hear him. With eyes frozen and popping at the cage, was screaming in thin, piercing tones. The astronomer was saying, A quiet burial is all we can do. There's no point in any publicity now. When they heard the screams. She had not entirely recovered by the time she reached them. Running and running, it was minutes before her husband could extract sense from her. She was saying finally, I tell you... They're in the barn. I don't know what to do. They are. No, no. She barred the industrial's quick movement in the direction. She said, don't you go. Send one of the hands with a shotgun. I, I, I tell you, I, I never saw anything like it. Little horrible beasts with, with, I can't describe, to think that Red was touching them and trying to feed them. He was holding them and feeding them meat. Um, Red began, I, I only, and Slim said, I, I was not. The industrialist said quickly, now you boys have done enough harm today. March into the house and not a word, not one word. I'm not interested in anything you have to say. After all this is over, I'll hear you out. And as for you, Red, I'll see that you're properly punished. He turned to his wife. Now, whatever the animals are, we will have them killed. He added quietly once the youngsters were out of hearing. Come, come, the children aren't hurt. And after all, they haven't done anything really terrible. They've just found a new pet. The astronomer spoke with difficulty. <clears throat> Uh, pardon me, ma'am, but can you describe the animals? She shook her head. She was quite beyond words. Can you just tell me if they... I'm sorry, said the industrialist apologetically, but I think I had better take care of her. Will you excuse me? A moment, just please, one, one moment. She said she'd never seen such animals before. Surely it is not usual to find animals that are completely unique on an estate such as this. I'm I'm sorry, let's let's not discuss this now. Except that unique animals might have landed during the night. The industrialist stepped away from his wife. What are you implying? I think we'd better go to the barn, sir. The industrialist stared a moment, turned and quite uncharacteristically began running. The astronomer followed, and the woman's wail rose unheeded behind them. The industrialist stared, looked at the astronomer, and then turned to stare again. Those? Those, said the astronomer. I have no doubt we appear strange and repulsive to them. 
What do they say? Why, that they are uncomfortable and tired and even a little sick, but they are not seriously damaged, and that the youngsters treated them well. Treated them well? Scooping them up, keeping them in a cage, giving them grass and raw meat to eat. Tell me how to speak to them. Oh, it, it may take a little time. Think at them. Try to listen. It will come to you, but perhaps not right away. The industrialist tried. He grimaced with the effort of it, thinking over and over again. The youngsters were ignorant of your identity. And the thought was suddenly in his mind. We were quite aware of it, and because we knew they meant well by us, according to their own view of the matter, we did not attempt to attack them. Attack them? thought the industrialist and said it out loud in his concentration. Why, yes, came the answering thought. We are armed. One of the revolting little creatures in the cage lifted a metal object, and there was a sudden hole in the top of the cage, and another in the roof of the barn, each hole rimmed with charred wood. We hope, the creatures thought, it will not be too difficult to make repairs. The industrialist found it impossible to organize himself to the point of directed thought. He turned to the astronomer, and with that weapon in their position, they let themselves be handled and caged? I don't understand. But the calm thought came. We would not harm the young of an intelligent species. It was twilight, and the industrialist had entirely missed the evening meal and remained unaware of the fact. He said, Do you really think the ship will fly? If they say so, said the astronomer, I'm sure it will. They'll be back, I hope, before too long. And when they do, said the industrialist energetically, I will keep my part of the agreement. What is more, I will move sky and earth to have the world accept them. I was entirely wrong, doctor. Creatures that would refuse to harm children under such provocation as they received are admirable. But, you know, I almost hate to say this. Say what? The kids, yours and mine, I'm almost proud of them. Imagine seizing these creatures, feeding them, or, or trying to, and keeping them hidden. The amazing gall of it. Red told me it was his idea to get a job in a circus, and then the strength of them. Imagine. The astronomer said, Youth, the merchant said. Will we be taking off soon? Half an hour, said the explorer. It was going to be a lonely trip back. All the remaining seventeen of the crew were dead, and their ashes were to be left on a strange planet. Back they would go with the limping ship and the burden of the controls entirely on himself. The merchant said, It was a good business stroke, not harming the young ones. We'll get very good terms. Very, very good terms. The explorer thought, Ugh, business. The merchant then said, They've lined up to see us off. All of them. You don't think they're too close, do you? It would be bad to burn any of them with the rocket blast at this stage of the game. They're safe. Horrible looking things, aren't they? Pleasant enough inside. Their thoughts are perfectly friendly. You wouldn't believe it of them. That immature one, the one that first picked us up, I... They call him Red, provided the explorer. That's a weird name for a monster. It makes me laugh. He actually feels bad that we're leaving. I mean, only I can't make out exactly why. The nearest I can come to it is something about a lost opportunity with some organization or other... I, I, I can't quite interpret. A circus, said the explorer briefly. What? The impertinent monstrosity. Why not? What would you have done if you had found him wandering on your native world? Found him sleeping on a field on earth? Red tentacles, six legs, pseudopods and all? Red watched the ship leave. His red tentacles, which gave him his nickname, quivered their regret at lost opportunity to the very last, and the eyes at their tips filled with drifting yellowish crystals that were the equivalent of earthly Short Transmissions was created by Heather Johnson Yu, produced and edited by Rachel Emerson, music by Molly Walburn, brought to you by Edgeworks Nebula. Tune in next week for the next episode.
of short, short, short transmissions. transmissions. Edgewick's Nebula.